Shane Gillis has done SNL after SNL cancelled Shane Gillis. So what does this tell us about SNL, cancel culture and the requirements of the mainstream and its inevitable hypocrisy as it struggles to stay relevant while getting rid of all of its best performers? <laughs> Hello there, you Awakening Wonders. Thanks for joining us on this voyage to truth and freedom that we must undertake together. Remember, we make content basically all day, every day. And if you click the link in the description, you will get our additional content where we go deeper, closer to the truth, and where we try to build a movement together to oppose this establishment that we clearly cannot trust. Indeed, it does not trust itself. Because SNL, just a few years after sacking Shane Gillis because of stuff he said in his podcast that weren't, I don't know, woke enough or right on enough, has had to bring Shane Gillis back as host of SNL. Now, my feelings about Shane Gillis is he's probably the best American stand-up comedian since Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock. That he's on point, he's radical, he's easy, he's accessible. And I would say, in America 10, 15 years ago, what you would have in Shane Gillis and the way he would have been used and operated by the culture would be somewhere between John Candy and John Belushi. A little less cuddly, perhaps, than John Candy and a little less, well, let's face it, drugged than John Belushi, but a skilled character the comedian, a brilliant stand-up comic, someone whose takes are on point in a difficult cultural moment. But since those kind of figures have died, the culture has changed. It's become unable to accommodate, in some cases, literally, comedy itself. It cannot accommodate comedy. I want you to remember that SNL is the show that after Joe Rogan, who doesn't make any pretenses of being a cultural leader or a thought leader, continually identifying himself as just a bloke, just a guy, just a comic, when he said, hey, this is how I got better from COVID, I used ivermectin, the the whole media establishment went crazy, including SNL, who did sketches to attack Joe Rogan. So SNL, as a cultural artifact, has made itself pretty clear about which side of the divide it's on. Indeed, they had Nikki Haley on a couple of weeks ago. They are anti-MAGA, anti-debate, anti-conversation. You will not see anti-globalist, anti-war issues discussed on SNL. I hosted SNL a mere one time and I thought that it was a sort of brilliant and magnificent institution to tell you the truth. Lorne Michaels, a genius and great patron of comedy and perhaps the arts more broadly. The cast at that time included brilliant people like Kristen Wiig and Bill Hader, skillful, excellent comedians. But even that was much earlier in the cultural moment that you and I are experiencing right now. What I will say is that Shane Gillis, in a sense, is a perfect vessel for us to analyze and understand what's happened in our culture in the last 10 years. Someone who would have once just walked straight through the door into a bunch of national lampoon movies, would have been seen as a star and celebrated, is now an odd key mercurial figure precisely because the culture doesn't know what it's doing anymore. It doesn't know what it believes in. It doesn't know what its principles are. Primarily, I would say, because it's become a utensil of the establishment rather than a radical anti-establishment entity, which is what it would have been in the days of, like, I don't know, Eddie Murphy, Mike Myers, all of the great comics that all of us that love comedy grew up on and adore, even if we're not actually American. Let's have a look at Shane Gillis's performance and appearance. Let's have a look at Shane Gillis as a figure. But more importantly, perhaps even Shane Gillis, is let's look at how our culture is morphing and changing and how ultimately its requirement to get clicks and views will mean that it will migrate to wherever it needs to and possibly eat itself like a Euroboralis. That's a self-consuming serpent. And could we have a better image for the legacy media? My mom asked me this a lot and it's kind of an intense question. My mom asked me, she's like, when did we stop being best friends? And she's right. We used to be best friends. You remember that when you were a little boy and you like, you loved your mom and you thought she was the cool. You remember when you were gay? <laughs> He's going to use gay in that way on TV. And even that is, I suppose, a marker of the challenges in our culture. Have you seen the South Park episode where those other geniuses that refuse to be chained by a peculiarly puritanical culture, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, argue that the pejorative form of gay is not connected to the sexual identity usage of gay, that it can be separated from it. You can be gay and not be a fag. Yeah, a lot of fags aren't gay. I happen to be gay, boys. Do you think I'm a fag? Do you ride a big, loud Harley and go up and down the streets ruining everyone's nice time? No. 
then you're not a fag. When you're invited to look at culture in the way that Google AI asks us to look at culture now, like, yeah, why not portray uh, George Washington as a person of color or Vikings as having a variety of hues and pigments in their skin? Is it not possible that you could use the word gay without it being a hate crime against gay people? Do we really believe that Shane Gillis has malice in his heart when he uses that term in the same way that kids from his background presumably use that word to this day without hating on people that have sexual preferences for people of the same gender. And this kind of deliberate myopism that leads to censorship, that leads to communities of people that doubt themselves and doubt one another, where people get all uncertain, we're all in a McCarthyist frenzy against one another, I think benefits the establishment in subtle cultural ways. America can't have the robust certainty that it had in the 70s and 80s, and God knows America had its problems then, if it's uncertain about the use of language and the intentions of its individual members or cultural artifacts or comedians or artists. If it's uncertain about where it stands on those issues, if it's forever heading towards more division instead of more union. Like most men, I know exactly when me and my mom stopped being friends. It was, uh, it was the first time I whacked off. Before that, you're like, oh, where's my mom? I love my mom. She's so cool. One nut, you're like, when's that bitch gonna leave the house? <laughs> In a sense, these are recognisable stand-up comedy tropes. Your mother, masturbation, and there's a whole Freudian angle to leap into right here. But in a way, isn't what Shane Gillis is doing there exactly what a comedian should be doing? Gently approaching taboos in a way that's celebratory and amusing and joyful and mischievous and playful. And when you can see him as an individual, it's pretty clear that this is not a man who runs on malice and hate, who you imagine festering alone in some room, hating on people because of some minor cultural difference. He has the mind of a comedian that says his information solely on whether or not it's amusing to him and then takes the risk of publicly exploring those ideas as comedians are supposed to. Now, when you live in a puritanical culture that seems to have as one of its predicates create division, create hatred, create kind of a dull, low expectation of what our social discourse is permitted to be, then figures like that, who 20 years ago would have just been, oh, he's funny, that guy, he's funny, become like, whoa, that's not Lenny Bruce. In fact, Shane Gillis is pretty clear that he's not a Bill Hicks type comic. Shane Gillis is not about, I hate the establishment. Man, I want to destroy it. He just wants to make people laugh. And for a comedian, what better goal could there be? But it shows you, doesn't it, where the establishment is when the sanctioned comics of a culture are only allowed very particular perspectives. Challenges are met when it is a person of colour like Chappelle or Chris Rock who do not play ball and have the skills to not play ball. But when you got Bill Burr, or now most specifically Shane Gillis venturing into those territories, what you've got is a peculiar lens to look at a culture that no longer knows what it wants or who it is and is operating, I think, most of all, on ungrounded principles. I wonder if you'll see the kind of comics that are sanctioned by the culture exploring ideas like the current Forever Wars. The culture's comics won't offer you that. So it's not like they went the direction of Bill Hicks or Lenny Bruce or Pryor. It went the direction of some kind of anodyne flat, non-controversial, non-interesting iteration of comedy. But people like you and me like people like Shane Gillis. So I guess you gotta make the booking. I do have family members with Down syndrome. <laughs> it almost got me. I... <laughs> I dodged it, but it nicked me. It's lovely to hear that actually the audience are uncertain as to whether or not Down syndrome is a topic you're permitted to laugh at in New York City liberal establishment circles. So the claim of a artifact, a cultural artifact like SNL, to be popular and populist is challenged there because it's clearly governed by a paradigm that's strictly establishment left these days. I mean left in terms of Clinton, Blair, authoritarianism, censorship. I don't mean left as in, do you know what, working people are getting a bit of a rough deal with their hands to corporate that left. I don't know where that is anymore. Hello? And you can hear that the people in that audience are uncertain as to whether or not it's permissible to laugh at down syndrome. Well, what Gillis has done, because he's a brilliant comedian, he's told you, I got more right than you to love about it because I've got family members. So he's allowing them, he's rolling out a carpet upon which he can walk into that joke, but they're still nervous. Are we allowed to joke about this? Are we allowed to joke about this? And actually, in effect, you should be allowed to joke about bloody well anything at all. In fact, it's a valve, it's a necessity. I heard laughter is the shame, what tears are to grief. How are we to get back together as a culture without people making jokes about race, about sexuality, 
poverty, about mental health, about war, about despair, about the conditions we find ourselves in. Oh, look, yes, yet another avenue that could bring about congeniality and collective action shut down, even something as potentially abstract as being able to laugh together. My niece has Down syndrome, and uh, I thought that was going to get a bigger laugh. Uh... <laughs> what you can't negotiate with is a comedian's instinct, which he has. It's always about finding edges. It's always about gently crossing it. It's always about curating and orchestrating the audience response. But that can't organically occur in a pre-cultivated and pre-bunked environment. That's what's dangerous about the culture war. That the kind of things we would joke about and laugh about together that would bring us closer are now being designated as points of avoidance culturally for all of us. And it takes a comedian like Shane Gillis to sort of guide us back into that space. They're doing better than everybody I know. <laughs> They're the only ones having a good time pretty consistently. They're not worried about the election. <laughs> They're having a good time. Actually funny. My sister, my niece's mother, she didn't know she could get pregnant, so she, she foster cared and then adopted three black kids, and then she finally got pregnant, and now she has a kid with Down syndrome, and uh, her husband is from Egypt. He's an Arab guy. You go over to their house, it's like getting in the craziest Uber pool you've ever been. <laughs> it's, it's oh, crazy. man, that's good, that's good. <laughs> Like, how did you guys meet? This is... What you can actually see is that well, those of us that are not American, that talk about America, are mostly impacted by America's wars and America's influence on the culture. Shane Gillis reminds you that America is this kind of cultural melting pot where that most ordinary and maligned of beasts, the white American male, is actually a rather enjoyable entity. He is not a product of the metropolis. He is a red state product. He is an ordinary American man. And he is a funny, amusing, open-hearted, non-cynical, beautiful American man. He's the kind of comedian America needs right now. All the while it's telling you, what we need are people that tick these boxes. Just let it be. Just stay out of comedy. Comedy will look after itself. You've done a bad enough job at organising the geopolitical landscape without diving into the arts, and in particular comedy. Just leave it alone. We'll handle it. Some white kids out there are like, hey, you're not allowed to play with us. You're retarded. And then uh, three black kids come flying out of nowhere. <laughs> Also, the nuances, the nuances of culture. Think of the kind of analyses that surround MAGA and Jan 6th and Trump. The idea that there's this homogenous blob of Americans that are racist and hateful. Well, let's peer into that blob a little and see who occupies it. And you will see intermarriage. You will see inclusivity. Because like you, you know people that have different sexual identities. You know people that have mental illnesses or genetic conditions or different religions. It's a media creation. And the media creation that led to the cancellation of Shane Gillis is now having to backpedal because through the merit of his skill and the way that the media landscape has changed, let's face it, he's a creation of independent media, podcasts, Joe Rogan, all of the stuff that exists in the similar channels that we're in right now. Now it's having to reassess. But Shane Gillis isn't safe. Nobody is safe. This is why cancel culture is a bad thing because it's a bad faith approach. That's what it is. It's the assumption of negativity. It's the assumption of malignance when a little more exploration, a little more conversation might reveal that perhaps people have a greater hope of integration, peace, ease, and evolution than the culture will ever let you believe. It's like a nice moment. <laughs> yeah, you guys you said cracker. Uh... Here's another take on Shane Gillis' appearance. So the man deemed morally untouchable, unworthy to be in SNL's regular week-in, week-out lineup just a few years ago, returned to host an episode of his own, one of American entertainment's most coveted guest spots, usually occupied by Hollywood A-listers. Gillis's fall and rise is a reminder of how brutal cancel culture can be and how spectacularly it can backfire. I know a lot of people in the movie space are starting to say that the success of Barbie and the success of Top Gun Maverick is also an indication that if you make movies for an understood demographic in the case of Barbie, presumably in the majority females and vice versa in the case of Top Gun Maverick, you get success. Whereas if you take genres that are traditionally or conventionally, whatever word suits you, intended to, the fact is 65% of people that go and see superhero movies are male. And if you try to turn those products into something that carries a particular message, and I believe there are really important messages that need to be carried through movies, but when those messages are at odds with the story, when those messages don't make sense and they're disingenuous, what you're going to get is a hodgepodge of odd, disingenuous crap instead of successful movies like Barbie or Top Gun Maverick. And 
Also, what it exposes is that it's an illegitimate endeavor. I don't actually know what they're trying to achieve with all this stuff. When he was named as a new SNL cast member in 2019, Gillis was unknown beyond the stand-up circuit. Within days of him being handed the opportunity of a lifetime, alumni include Bill Murray, Eddie Murphy, and Tina Fey, a journalist dug up a clip of him using the racial slur chink on an old episode of Matt and Shane's Secret Podcast, a podcast he does with fellow comic Matt McCusker. While Gillis was, he says, impersonating a white racist when he said it, saying it wasn't enough to damn him. That's precisely the kind of explanation that should be taken into account. Well, I was doing an impersonation of a racist. That doesn't matter. That impersonation was so good, you cannot have a career now because of the quality of the impersonation and our inability to assess nuance, which is absolutely necessary in comedy. It was all over before he had taped a single episode. SNL briefly tried to ride out the controversy before unceremoniously dropping Gillis. A statement described the language in his previous work as offensive, hurtful, and unacceptable. But again, if you were to perhaps look at the work of Bill Murray or Mike Myers or Tina Fey through the lens of today's cultural rules, you might find similar adjectives being required. In fact, if you look at comedy at any time, cruelty is sort of literally a necessity in much of comedy. Gillis refused to issue a groveling apology, nor did he refashion himself as a conservative culture warrior. He just kept making comedy. He put out a brilliant special on YouTube, Live in Austin, which currently has 24 million views. He put out viral sketches, he toured what you might call the Joe Rogan circuit, the hugely successful, decidedly un-PC podcast orbit in the 56-year-old comic turned podfather. Meanwhile, Matt and Shane's secret podcast exploded in popularity. It's currently the biggest pod on Patreon with tens of thousands of paid subscribers. Following his 2023 blockbuster Netflix special, Beautiful Dogs, Gillis is now on the verge of arena act status. You can see why SNL came calling. Notoriety alone doesn't do this, of course. The now 36-year-old Gillis is also easily among the best stand-ups of his generation. He is also that rare rarest of things in the achingly right on superficially diverse but socially monocultural world of American comedy. I think that's an important point. Monocultural socially but diverse superficially. That's an excellent assessment. A child of Fox News watching lower middle class suburban America. In the post-2016 age, Gillis is the imagined villain of the liberal elites and the living breathing antithesis of all their deadening pieties. Brought up in central Pennsylvania, Gillis was a high school football star turned army college dropout. He looks and talks and jokes like someone's older brother from back home. He says, gay and retarded with abandon, but largely to mock his own meat-headed tendencies. He'll send up his new woke Brooklyn friends, whose every social media post boils down to see I'm not racist, just as much as he does his conservative, somewhat dysfunctional family. His material about his dad watching Fox News every night until he's too drunk and or outraged to continue is a wonderful case in point. Fox News is basically black church for old white dudes, Gillis observes in Live Austin as he watches his father vigorously agreeing with absolutely everything the anchors say. Mm Mm-hmm, preach, Tucker. So it is with his routines on the Donald. Gillis has had some of the best Trump material you're here precisely because he isn't blinded by any Trump fury. He gets how funny, intentionally and unintentionally Trump is, his outrageousness, his bizarre tics and cadences. But nor does he serve up endless pronoun gags and tirades against the Dems and SJWs. Gillis says he didn't vote for Trump, although he has joked that he has early onset republicanism given he's a history buff. There are plenty of people who are unhappy that Gillis has been re-embraced by the mainstream entertainment biz. His SNL rehabilitation proves how effortlessly the comedy industry forgives racism, reads one typically breathless Vox column, but you can't help but feel that those kind of people are becoming more shrill precisely because they know they are beginning to lose ground. The triumph of Shane Gillis reveals that there is a vast ecosystem of platforms and shows that can outstrip the reach of the dwindling mainstream. An episode of the Joe Rogan experience reportedly reaches twice as many people as your average edition of Saturday Night Live. And now some of the gatekeepers are beginning to realise the talent and the viewing figures they can miss out on when they confuse the mob for the country. It seems that four years after sacking him, SNL needed Shane Gillis more than Shane Gillis needed needed SNL. Often we talk about how journalists like Chris Hedges and Glenn Greenwald could be used to monitor the decline of the legacy media. Both of those men won Pulitzer Prizes and worked for organisations like The Guardian, the legacy media, British newspaper, or The New York Times in the case of Chris Hedges. But now those reporters do all of their reporting online because the legacy media has become an amplification device for the establishment and a tool to normalise its agenda. The same can be said of the culture if you watch late night talk shows or SNL. It's pretty clear that they operate in locks step with the agenda of those kind of print organisations. And similarly, perhaps, they are suffering as a result of the inability to include genuine diversity of opinion that is easily accessible to those of us that operate entirely now in independent media spaces. So I suppose the appearance of Shane Gillis on SNL does, as the author of that piece indicated, show you that the balance of power is changing. It will be interesting to see how that reality plays out in political spheres, how it plays out in terms of censorship, how it plays out in terms of cancel 
culture and the culture's ability to rehabilitate or reclaim its discarded icons. The thing is this, of course, as the dynamic and relationship between independence and establishment continues to alter, many more people won't want to be involved in the establishment and its accessories precisely because they are tools of an agenda that independence and freedom are ultimately opposed to. But I'm glad to see a comedian of Shane Gillis's quality getting the opportunity to host a show that remains a comedy institution in spite of its obvious current frailties. But that's just what I think. Why don't you let me know what you think in the comments and the chat. Remember, you can support our work by clicking the link in the description. You get extra content. We talk about the culture. We assess and criticize cultural artifacts. Last week's video was about Amy Winehouse. This week we'll be talking about COVID or war or something. We make additional content just for you. But damn it, we need you. Just like SNL needs Shane Gillis. More important than any of that is if you can, please stay free. Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to see more uncensored content where free speech can flourish, join our live stream. Click the link right here to watch the next video if you want to, or become a member of a growing movement. Download the Rumble app and you'll be informed every time we make a new piece of content. Stay free.